Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those who are just joining now, uh, of course, we've had breakfast briefings today, plenary sessions, roundtables, but of course, welcome to the 8th Oman Energy Forum. Um, just to give you some background, which touches on a the theme today, um, we're really addressing what essentially was created in 2015, which is the Oman Energy Master Plan 2040. Of course, PDO has been a major uh, enabler of recommendations from this, but in 2015, we brought together the top 100 stakeholders in the energy sector from CEOs to government officials and academia to essentially create a roadmap for the future. And what emerged was five pillars that had to be addressed. We had energy demand, energy supply, R&D, labor, and of course, the theme of today, which is the water food energy nexus. Um, we've used the Oman Energy Forum as, a, as kind of a vehicle to establish recommendations and action plans to, to kind of turn the dial on things and move uh, essentially the industry in Oman forward as a whole. Um, I'm happy to uh, introduce our distinguished guest today who will be giving a lecture, Dr. Cleo Alhanashi, Energy Technology Lead at PDO. We'll be discussing energy renewal, essentially unit within PDO, which is turning the dial on energy transition, and of course, addressing the nexus as well, um, discussing collaboration models to accelerate Oman's energy transition specifically. Just some house rules. Uh, the session will last for roughly 30 minutes. Um, you know, for the first part, we will have a presentation or lecture by Dr. Khalil, um, and then we'll open it up to you, the audience, for Q&A. So throughout this entire session, feel free to ask questions in the chat, and we will answer that after Dr. Khalil is done with his comments. That being said, Dr. Khalil, I'm happy to hand it over to you. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, for the introduction, uh, Brian, and, uh, and uh, it's give me pleasure to be here today and uh, shed some light on 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 the collaboration models we have been working uh, with with so many stakeholders here in Oman to to touch upon the uh, uh, the transition agenda and, and how can Oman collectively and collaboratively. Uh, go through this transition uh, for, for the benefit of everybody. Uh, just allow me to share my slides. Okay, can, you, can you see the slides now? Yep, looks good. Right, okay, so, so the, the discussion today or the, the, the topic in the next 30 minutes will be around uh, the collaborative models to accelerate Oman energy transition and, and we'll touch on some examples uh, with, with whom are we are we are we uh, collaborating and how can the the, the cross sectorial uh, or the cross sectorial initiatives be be enabled by the energy sector which is by large one of the most uh, uh, the biggest uh, and the most um, effective or involved in in the transition uh, uh, the content will go through the case for Oman collaborative energy transition. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, some global transition trends and, and especially on the on the human capital and on the on the industries or the sectors that uh, globally would be affected. And we expect uh, Oman as a major energy exporter to probably see the same the same trends and effects. Uh, on number three, we'll uh, we'll touch about uh, energy renewal and industrial collaboration spheres. What are the, the two main spheres that we are in? We are trying to to build momentum in industrial collaboration in. Uh, and uh, the thief of, of this discussion, I think, of this presentation will be on number four. We'll will will go through three examples of, of a previous or ongoing uh, collaborations currently uh, happening on the ground, and those are the, the demonstrators for the industrial collaboration for transition. Uh, we'll finish by, by just uh, uh, sending out some thoughts on, on what is next and can, how can we take this to the next level. Now, uh, if we look at 2019 and deliberately here choose 2019 to, to, uh, to take out any COVID biases, uh, uh, Oman uh, top five exports. Uh, were mainly the crude petroleum or the crude oil, uh, petroleum gas, or more technically the LNG for those who are from, from the industry. Uh, and refined petroleums, this is some of the uh, refinery uh, products that uh, we do have uh, refineries in the country and the third refinery is on the way. Not all the refined petroleum uh, from Oman are consumed, but uh, the idea is to maximize the value. We can refine our petroleums and export those refined products. 
Uh, and number four on, on the X top five export list is, is the semi finished iron. And this is uh, mainly driven by the, the Sahar industrial uh, uh, port and free zone where we see the aluminium, the steel and the steel manufacturing at different levels, uh, uh, supporting or, or exporting to the Asian market and the global market at large as well. And, and number five, we have the nitrogenous fertilizers. And, and this is for those who are also in the industry, the, the ammonia and the urea. And, and all the uh, fertilizers that actually uh, rely on, on, on nitrogen and hydrogen. Specific. Uh, today in the country, we have quite a sizable uh, urea and ammonia fertilizer plants that actually consumes natural gas uh, to, to make those fertilizers. So this is also in the context of today's discussion, uh, the energy sector is providing fertilizers for the agriculture sector where the food comes from, and that is a critical part for the, for the food uh, uh, part of the nexus. And if we look a little bit down the line or, or fast forward, uh, where, what will happen to, to such exports and how does the world perceive the energy transition impact on these top five uh, exports from the country? And, and, and the, map, the map on the right shows you the, the main export hubs, I would say, or the main industrial and development hubs in Oman, Sohar, uh, Sur, uh, Dukum, and Salala. Uh, moving into the uh, transition scenario, uh, we already saw the emergence of new commodities in the global energy transitions. Uh, people already talk about low carbon fruit and petroleum products. And uh, I think uh, last month uh, uh, there was an interesting announcement from SNP who publishes the uh, uh, the crude index prices and 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 advise the market on on how much is crude is uh, is expected to cost. They announced that they're going to publish a CO2 intensity. So uh, you will not only hear uh, Brent crude uh, price, but you'll also in the future is expected you will hear the crude pricing and the CO2 or intensity, and it's already at a trial stage uh, with SMB. Uh, on that is uh, linking to number one. On number two, uh, the LNG, uh, we already hear uh, uh, LNG new, uh, carbon neutral LNGs, and I think uh, in Oman, Oman LNG was uh, pioneering in testing out the first shipment of carbon neutral LNG. Uh, on number three, we already saw in the market uh, the starting of uh, demands for low carbon refined petroleum, green chemicals, uh, some, some people would call them, uh, and into the industry, the methanol and the like. Uh, and number four, on the semi uh, or the finished iron product, uh, green steel is, is already uh, in the, in, on the way to be traded in London Metal Exchange. And, uh, and we've seen uh, car manufacturers, for example, discussing uh, the fact that if I'm going to build uh, an electric car because I care about the environment, what about the steel I use in that car? All the components should, should be compliant so, or low carbon, at least uh, compliant. So this is an emerging uh, commodity tradable in the, in the globe. Uh, we also see uh, the low carbon and the green nitrogenous, uh, nitrogenous fertilizers. Uh, this is the green ammonia or the blue ammonia uh, from uh, natural gas, but with, without the CO2 effect. So all these top five commodities or top five exports in Oman are, are going to see changes in the future and the transition would go at a certain speed. Uh, it is happening. Uh, the only uncertainty is how fast uh, it is happening. Now, if we reflect on the on the global trends and what would this mean for uh, for the globe at large and for Oman specifically in the context of an energy exporting nation, uh, on the top right uh, side of the um, of the screen, you see how how are the jobs expected uh, to change based on two scenarios. Now, uh, energy transition uh, could have different uh, magnitude and different speed. Uh, and the International Energy Agency states different scenarios. And on the top right uh, side of the screen, you'll see uh, a prediction of two scenarios of transition. Uh, STEPS, or the Stated uh, Energy Policy Scenarios, uh, which is the first two columns on your uh, on the graph on the left. Those are basically uh, an energy transition based on what countries have announced, uh, what countries have put plans for, uh, whether it is electric cars or electrification of the of the industrial sector or using solar and wind, uh, and and they have published or announced their pledges, including the uh, the, the NDCs or the uh, contribution from countries to reduce the CO2. What would the, the impact of this uh, be on the on the workforce? 
And the second uh, scenario, which is represented by the, by the two columns on the uh, on the right of the top, uh, top hand side uh, graph, is the NZE or the net zero uh, energy scenario. The net zero scenario is basically the, the most aggressive scenario or the most ambitious scenario, if we can say, where the whole world will not emit CO2 more than what it can consume. So there will be a, I mean, a CO2 neutrality or greenhouse gas neutrality in the atmosphere. So we all will continue the business, we'll continue the energy, but we'll not be contributing to any increase in the greenhouse gas emission. Both scenarios shows there will be a changes to the workforce, for example. Uh, in both scenarios, there will be new jobs created. And, and those new jobs created will be far more than those jobs that will need to be retrained or repurposed. And this is an opportunity uh, to, to, to all the energy uh, consuming countries to start preparing for those new jobs. And the earlier we do it, the better we are prepared. And if you look at the new jobs, they are in the bioenergy sector, the renewables and the power generation, the electric vehicle, the grid and the energy efficiency and all those topics. Uh, somehow or another, we're touched upon since this morning on what are those energy uh, transition spheres or, or uh, businesses. If we move to the, uh, to the bottom graph, what we see is Again, different scenarios for a transition, and uh, each scenario will assume a reduction of, of CO2 emission or CO2 equivalent emission. And if we look at the, uh, the stated uh, scenarios or stated uh, energy transition scenario, we don't see uh, much uh, reduction. Uh, again, what we see clearly here is the physical contribution of the power sector and the industry sector. This is the, the, uh, the light yellow and the uh, blue or turquoise uh, bars. Uh, in a uh, uh, sustainable development scenario, which is a United Nations scenario for, uh, for achieving sustainable development across the world, we see big reduction in the CO2 emissions, especially from those two sectors. And again, in the most aggressive uh, or the most ambitious scenario, the net zero emission would see big reduction in, the, uh, uh, in, in both industry and power sector. Uh, again, the industry and the power sector are a major transition uh, contributors. Having said that, and there was an, a need for uh, for setting up something or, or, or leading this transition or seeding the transition, if I may say, uh, and then the energy renewable, renewal uh, initiative comes in, and which is basically in, in, in another term, renewing the sector or, or driving the sector to the new uh, or the renewed scenarios or the renewed settings of the energy sector in Oman. This was initially an initiative that uh, uh, that was uh, supported and initiated by IBM, PGO, OVAD, and many of the, of the energy sectors uh, that have encouraged the initiative or encouraged the work to be, to be started. And we see two main spheres for, for energy renewal to act upon or to help the industry work together. That is the energy technology, uh, where technology is a key for the country. I think it's the, the IEA again who predicts that 90% uh, of the transition will come or the net zero scenario, 90% of the of the technologies needed to achieve the net zero are technologies yet to, 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 to become commercial. So the technologies in the energy sector will play a major role and it is an expensive to verify and test technology, a collective and collaborative work on, on energy technologies is of benefit to the nation and benefit to the industry. And under energy technology, we're talking about energy technology centers where work could be very much focused on certain aspects, advanced biofuels that are that will be needed to decarbonize certain industries, uh, GHG reduction, including the carbon capture, sequestration, and utilization, the CCSU, advanced chemicals, and digital technologies that are also expected to, uh, to be a key enabler for, for this transition. Uh, integrated energy models. I mean, we are moving from oil and gas as, a, as a only uh, energy vectors in the country and for export into more complex energy system. Uh, we'll have renewables, we'll have hydrogen, uh, other countries also have, have other sources. So understanding the interaction between the energy sources in the country is important and that would need a lot of integrated modeling work. Uh, strategic studies and cases for change, technology, intelligence, and scenarios will be one of the uh, focuses for energy renewal in the, in the time to come. The other aspect or the other big sphere is the energy value chain, and uh, we need to develop the value chains. Energy transition will bring in new energy vectors like hydrogen. What about everything before and after the manufacturing of the manufacturing of hydrogen? 
how can we develop the energy value chain from day one and move hand in hand. We develop the transition uh, industries and also we develop the energy value chain, including the knowledge management that come with it and also the dialogue, the dialogue that come with it. Now, moving into a little bit of uh, practical or examples or, or what have we done so far? Where do we come from? Uh, I think we'll talk about three main examples. Uh, the first example is, is, is the National Hydrogen Alliance. Uh, again, this is uh, an example that was also uh, touched upon this morning by Dr. Abdullah, where we see the hydrogen or the clean hydrogen as, as a future energy carrier that will not only help decarbonize uh, the country's uh, industries, but also provide an, uh, an, an economic diversification element where we could, Oman is, is, is going to be an exporter. Of, of hydrogen in different forms. And the, the global outlook for commercialization uh, of hydrogen uh, that is already started in certain areas. Uh, now we talk specifically about clean hydrogen, that is hydrogen uh, from renewables, which is green, or hydrogen from natural gas, but without the CO2 emission, which is blue. We see a good momentum in the, uh, in the transportation sector industrial feedstock. Uh, we already have industries that rely on hydrogen, uh, but this hydrogen is produced in a non-sustainable way or would need to reduce the footprint of this of CO2 footprint of this hydrogen, especially in refining in ammonia and methanol where natural gas today is consumed to produce ammonia and methanol and the CO2 is emitted, would need to gradually move into producing low carbon ammonia and low carbon methanol and low carbon refined product. On the transportation sector, I think uh, it is well uh, evident that while electric cars are moving very fast when it comes to the small passenger uh, cars, we have the long distance and the, and, the, uh, and the heavy trucking that would need hydrogen because it is more advantages compared to batteries where you would need really massive big batteries, heavy batteries to move a bus. When it comes to hydrogen, the weight or the energy per mass of hydrogen is much, much more lighter comparing to a battery, for example, for like, for, for large application. Shipping and and, uh, and and flights and airplanes would need to move into sustainable fuel in the long run. This is beyond 2030, where we would have would have to, to cut the emission from air travel and shipping. Uh, industrial energy, a lot of energies use heat, and today that heat in Oman and most of the globe is provided by natural gas that would need, have, would need to be decarbonized or the intensity of CO2 to be reduced. And the only way to do that is by introducing uh, carbon neutral fuels or like hydrogen or capturing the CO2 from the natural gas. The same goes for the building and the heat and power. Now to shed some light on, on the on the hydrogen alliance or the national hydrogen alliance that we have been working with, it's a, it's a 15 organizations now. So we started with 13 and subsequently we had two more uh, governmental organizations interested to be part of, of this uh, alliance. It's a 15 organization of government, energy and academia that is collaborating together to, uh, to integrate the development of the fundamentals of hydrogen. As we go forward, we have already seen hydrogen projects being announced in Oman. Uh, there would need to be an ecosystem to support these projects. We identify uh, and investigate the value added from hydrogen blending, for example, in hydrogen for export and hydrogen chemicals. What other industries can can rely on the on the on the clean hydrogen that we're going to produce in Oman? We we'll look also into developing a shared vision uh, for power hydrogen economy by 2040, capitalizing on the on the sultanate rich energy heritage. We have been energy exporting nation. We have a lot of capabilities when it comes to human capitals, when it comes to systems, dealing with gas is, is, is part of our energy uh, ecosystem, and hydrogen is an extension. Uh, to the to the energy uh, story in Oman, and, and as such, we should be uh, acting upon that. Uh, we'll have a lot of engagement in structure policy and discussions within the high fly. Uh, just like any new technology or a new introduction, there will be policy uh, and 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 uh, and strategic enablers needed to ensure we maximize the benefit of this of this newcomer to the energy industry. And the implementation roadmap uh, in, in collaboration with all the key players would also need to be uh, looked at within the context of the Hydrogen Alliance. 
The second example that I would like to talk about is, is the industrial digitalization surveillance strategy. Now, digitalization is a key enabler for, uh, for the transition, and I don't think transition can be effective or speedy enough without capitalizing on the digitalization. Uh, and uh, having said that, there was a need, or we saw a need where we can, we need to understand uh, the aspect of digitalization within the energy sector. So we launched out a, a, a collaborative work uh, under the uh, support of the Ministry of, uh, of Energy and Minerals and uh, various energy companies, including uh, Petroleum Development Oman and others, to map out the local capabilities in the industry, understand the global perspective, and how does that global perspective go into roll down on, on the industry, and also understand the local perspectives. Uh, and as is and future demand and where are the gaps today in the digitalization capabilities and in the digitalization also understanding and projects in Oman. Uh, and furthermore, from that, hopefully we'll be uh, concluding this work uh, sometime uh, by mid of next year and we look into designing a strategy and roadmap where the industry collaboratively can, can work on demonstrators, can work on, on uh, proof of concepts of some of the, of the digitalization technology there are so many uh, applications and opportunities, but the challenge is how do you prioritize and what, which one that, that brings the biggest value and not to be overwhelmed by the, by the digitalization enabler. The workflow for, for this work uh, has started uh, uh, this year. We'll look into four uh, main work packages or milestone delivery, deliveries. Uh, the current status will be mapped, the future status and the gap analysis and coming up to the end with the, with the strategy and the, and the roadmap. Now, uh, moving on from the digitalization, uh, of, of course, the, the coverage of this, we, we had quite a good participant and uh, the, I, the I idea was to look at the whole ecosystem that plays in the digitalization, including academia, SMEs and startup, uh, the big IT companies, the industry, when we share the industry, we have covered the oil and gas, the energy sector or the power sector. We've also included other industries like, like the, the manufacturing or the small manufacturing industries and, in, and the government's uh, entities that are also key and part of the ecosystem. Uh, to, to come up with, with a well understand uh, understanding picture of the digitalization. We're expecting a few key insights, uh, or we've already seen a few key insights from the uh, survey that we have conducted. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a listed inside. I think I'll pick a few on, on, from these. Uh, like we've already have a good map of the current digital project in different sectors, and what is the focus of each sector, and how can we create the synergies between uh, between different sectors. Uh, the R&D scope uh, is, is critical to be identified well above of, uh, of time if energies are moving into a certain uh, strategic uh, technologies. It makes sense to align the R&D scope in the country with, with such technologies. Uh, we'll also look into uh, the status of digital roadmap within companies. There are different maturities or different level of maturities within the energy sector. How can the sector learn from each other and how can we also uh, have a cross-sector learning. How can the agriculture sector also learn from uh, from from the energy sector when it comes to digitalization? The third example, which is, is more on the uh, on the on the technology demonstrators or on the ground demonstration of the uh, transition uh, technologies that we have talked about at the, at the beginning, which is energy technologies are a key pillar in the transition. Uh, we have uh, worked together with two of the key uh, players within the nexus. Uh, I've worked together with uh, Oman LNG as an energy player and Mizun Dairy as a, as, a, as a company from the food sector, uh, where we've managed to, uh, uh, to put a collaborative project for energy uh, demonstrator or a new energy to demonstrator from biogas. Uh, Mizun uh, Dairy already, uh, as, as you heard from Mr. Saleh this morning, invested in a biogas plant and where they are already into the circular uh, nature of their production. However, that biogas plant could be upgraded and, and uh, the a new technology of biogas to power could be tested to demonstrate this for the future projects that yes, we, we have waste in the, in, the, in the food sector or the food production sector, that waste could be turned into energy and internally consumed. Uh, 
so we've, we've, uh, we've got Oman LNG uh, uh, to support in a project where uh, the, the biogas engine was brought in to be integrated with an existing uh, biogas plant to produce green power that can be uh, locally used uh, by the Zoom Jail. And this is one of the examples that, that are uh, on the ground where industrial collaboration across sectors is, is key for the success of the, of the transition. So what is next? I think uh, moving forward, uh, it's, it's very important uh, that energy transition agenda uh, should be founded on framework-based collaboration. So far, what we have seen uh, throughout the, the two years and so uh, the working with the, with the industry, uh, it's a project-based. And we'd like to see, to find an opportunity and then build that opportunity in the project. I think time is, is, is here to, to have a framework. Uh, by which uh, there's an evident uh, transition programs and there are evident transition projects uh, collaboratively funded or collaboratively worked on by the industry. Uh, uh, they, they, they would also, in point number two, would be a need for a collaborative and shared national energy transition infrastructure. We are already talking about carbon capture. Uh, we'll still rely on our uh, natural gas, but there will be a need to remove the CO2. We would need uh, to build a shared CO2 pipelines, for example, where all the uh, decarbonization initiatives in different uh, part of the country can tap into that national infrastructure. It's a big venture. It's a, it's a big. Uh, it's a big funding. Fund. Uh, there's a big fund needed for such thing, and it's sometimes it's prohibitive for single entities to fund their own decarbonization. Uh, agenda and collective funding and collect, collective infrastructure is, is one of the key aspects going forward. Uh, we would need to develop the carbon capture utilization and storage cluster, CCUS. Uh, I've talked about it a lot this morning by different people that if the country would continue to, to, uh, to rely on oil and gas on, uh, for, for, the, for the energy input and the, the decarbonization need to happen gradually and CCUS is part of the game. Okay. Uh, again, hydrogen hubs were talked about here as, a, as an enabler for the hydrogen moving from projects into hubs where, where there is an integrated hydrogen ecosystem. Uh, the third point, I think uh, what we need to see next in the country is a visible, timely and strong policy and regulatory support for energy transition. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, People would be uh, should be allowed to cash in from the environment. Oman has commitment to the NDC, and and that commitment should be enforced and should be it should come from the industry. And we should transit the the, the first or the, the biggest emitter should play their role into into uh, the the NDC or the national district uh, contributed uh, of the, into the CO2 uh, reduction of the country. Uh, and last, I think uh, uh, it's a message to send out that. Energy renewal was set up to encourage collaboration. We do welcome collaboration and partnerships to enable Oman energy transition. And as I said before, uh, it's a journey that that all should work in it together. I mean, we shouldn't leave uh, somebody to fall behind because it is uh, a transition to the industry, a transition to the country. Uh, with that, I think I would like to end my my, my presentation and and then thank you for uh, for listening. Thank you, Dr. Khalil. I uh, appreciate your presentation. Um, for all attendees who are currently with us, just feel free to ask any questions in the chat box and we'll address them as well. I'd kind of like to kick off with one, um, essentially touching on collaboration, as you've mentioned. Um, I just you know, it was in a session before this touching on circular economy, the energy transition, and of course, collaboration and, and let's say Getting rid of silos essentially was a, a, a key element of that. I think a key element of today, um, but it was with international speakers who were offering best practice models for Oman. But coming from an Oman perspective, energy renewal PDO um, has done a lot of space. There, sorry, a lot of um, work in collaborating with partners uh, throughout Oman. Um, you know, what what would you say if you were looking outward for from your perspective of best practice models? for collaboration sharing throughout the region internationally. Um, what do you think would be your recommendations and actions based on your experience? You mentioned the Hydrogen Alliance, you have 15 partners there. Ijad was a massive partnership and collaboration effort. Uh, what do you think if you had to export your, your experience and, and practices in this space? Um, what would be your, your key points that you'd want to touch on? 
Uh, thank you for the question. It's an interesting one. I think the, the, the international collaboration comes at, at to me at, at two folds or two angles. Um, we will continue to be an energy exporting nation. And, and uh, there's no better than collaborating with your customers. So we do have customers in uh, uh, specifically in Asia, where if you look at our, our LNG and our crude, the majority of our LNG and crude goes out to Asia. And I think there will be a key element in, in energy transfer, for example, and also investment collaboration. So the customers would be able to, should be able to, to bring in investment uh, and collaborate at that level when, it, when the investment is a shared investment, there is a sustainability in the, there's a long-term sustainability in the, in the project, especially in the hydrogen project. And I think we started seeing that where we are, where investment, uh, collaborative investment or foreign investment is allowed and, the, and it's sometimes with, by the customers themselves. And that is a good model we should continue uh, build in. Uh, the other aspect, I think it, um, when it comes to the, to the know-how and the knowledge transfer. Uh, we are entering into a transition area uh, era that, that would hopefully post 2030 or 2040 will lead to a new energy system. I don't think we should walk into the similar scenarios where, where, where we have the resources, the technology is, is, is brought in and there is no actual technology development or technology transfer. I think we should start from now with the technology transfer, looking into the 2040 horizon and, and beyond where there is an actual technology development to fuel the, uh, the energy export. You mentioned, um, it, of course, a big part of this, uh, of propping this transition up and pushing it forward. You mentioned developing skill sets and, of course, the job opportunities behind this transformation. Um, how is energy renewal working with, let's say, academia, society with, within Oman um, to develop those skill sets and kind of really get it out there to Omani youth, this challenge that's, that's currently taking place and the opportunities in that space? Yeah, I think I would like to, to, to point out to two, two programs uh, greatly supported by the industry, seeded or initiated by PDO, as, uh, as PDO has always been generous and leading in this, in this, uh, in this area. Uh, as we speak today, I have, have, have six uh, young uh, boys and, and girls in the office that come from two programs. Uh, they are from either the, the intern program, which is for people who finish university that already training in the industry. And we have also uh, four uh, young bright ladies from the Idad program, if you've heard about Idad. Idad in Arabic means to preparation or to prepare somebody for something. And they are doing a year in, in, in industry. I think with, with the support with, with the support of the industry collectively, again, led by PDO uh, and, and by energy renewal support, uh, we managed uh, the, the industry launched for the second year now, uh, the year in industry. This is uh, shaping the higher education systems to allow students to take one more year, paid year, into the industry to make sure that when they go back to the final year in, in, uh, in the universities, the nature of the work or the nature of the thinking before they graduate is already uh, an industry of thinking. They have seen the transition or they have seen- It has seen a sharpened energy. focus, essentially. Yes, and, and they also uh, know what, what worries the energy sector, for example, now the transition and the CO2 emission is, is, is a word that they will take with them when they go back to their final year. And then one year after that, they come out to the market with, 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 a, with a conditioned mindset or prepared. I think uh, uh, the industry is, is doing a lot when it comes to, to preparing the workforce now, let alone the training and the, the purposing, but uh, it's really important to prepare the young guys who are coming into, into a different time uh, into the industry. I just wanted to, um, <laughs> to touch on hydrogen as well. You mentioned hydrogen hubs and a key you know, aspect that comes up in our conversations with our stakeholders throughout the region um, is exporting hydrogen. You know, what is the best way to export hydrogen? Is it to export it directly or to develop, as you mentioned, a hydrogen hub? You could create sustainable steel, for example, produced from hydrogen. What are you seeing from an energy renewal perspective? And what do you think is the best kind of path forward for Oman in that space? Uh, I think on, on the hydrogen export, and there are uh, maybe a technological limitation and an energy also, uh, you have to be energy conscious. Uh, there is no point producing a sustainable fuel and then shipping it and causing a lot of, of emission. Uh, and those both elements should be looked into uh, together. So we do produce the hydrogen. Uh, gray hydrogen is a mature technology. The blue and the green hydrogen is coming up. When it comes to shipping this hydrogen, 
I am not a big supporter, and I don't think it would be shipping the hydrogen as, as just hydrogen. It has to be converted uh, for several reasons. I think one reason, if we look at sea shipping, we ship LNG by sea today. If we're going to ship hydrogen by sea and then run the ship by a hydrogen derivative fuel, the same way I'm just drawing the, the, the analogy to LNG, uh, green ammonia or, or blue ammonia would be one of the attractive uh, uh, derivatives of hydrogen that could be produced. And again, this will allow us to capitalize on existing knowledge. We already have ammonia plants in, in Oman, for example. Now, it is much, much faster, much more efficient converting these into, into green or blue ammonia rather than building from scratch, and that's one. The other aspects, maximizing the value. So if I am going to produce green steel and there is a market for green steel, I am maximizing an in-country value, and that is will create more jobs, and, and we should also uh, go that route. So it is not one way or another. I think we should target both routes, grow our local industry. We have far, far more resources than what we can observe locally, and also uh, start driving the, the export uh, industry. As well. From the hydrogen conversations we've had um, as well, is there seems to be kind of an imbalance in supply and demand dynamics where supply might not be the actual issue, but generating hydrogen demand and the incentives uh, that come with that. Um, from you know your perspective at PDO and Energy Renewal, are you seeing you know a framework being put in place to help generate that hydrogen demand within Oman? Yes, I think. Uh... Policy incentives and and uh, and global uh, push toward decarbonization would would help. We have seen the the COP26 uh, mentioning coal for the first time, and and even though there was a last minute uh, push to change some terms from coal phase out to coal phase down, uh, and I think replacing coal by uh, by policy or by hydrogen reduction uh, incentives in Asian market uh, especially uh, is, is a good opportunity to increase that demand and uh, again uh, the, the technology is very crucial here we have already uh, uh, tracking the development with the Japanese where they are co-combusting ammonia which is a hydrogen derivative and coal so they won't have to invest into, into completely new hydrogen facilities or hydrogen power facilities the, the technology would allow us to transit and co-mix coal uh, with the hydrogen as we face down or face out coal uh, from from the from the world and uh, we are lucky here in Oman we don't have coal power plants we have gas power plants but again that is something we need to think about in the in the longer term 2030 and beyond how can we decarbonize our power sector and at the same time make it resilient uh, to the uh, to the to the environment and the and the climate change and just lastly you, you had mentioned Digitalization. I think we're seeing digitalization as a key aspect. I mean, if we're addressing water, food, energy nexus, it actually might be the glue that can help connect everything together um, and especially accelerating energy transition. Um, you know, Mon currently, and I imagine PDO and energy renewal leading this way, and you know, with your survey as well that is you know, being completed, are you seeing that in terms of digitalization, stakeholders in this space are still kind of at the beginning of their journey or you know are there roadmaps being created is is it kind of siloed in the sense where one might be here one might be there um how are you seeing that at oman at the moment and do you think that there needs to be more cohesion in that digitalization space uh, i think what we have seen so far is uh, is, uh, is is variations uh, I think uh, there are certain aspects that that pushes certain organizations to be forefront in, in company digitalization. For example, uh, companies that are large in size and have focus on efficiencies, this seems to tap into digitalization to back to understand, yeah, uh, big companies uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 will, will suffer from from not knowing or not seeing the facts. So digitalization will bring all these data to your eyes, and you can act quickly. And uh, the smaller companies probably they don't see the need, but I think they are happy to kind of learn and and get on when the product is is final and shaped. And uh, the interesting part I think on this variation is is we've seen. Uh, a lot of the young workforce are digital ready, or those what, what I think what the what the research call them digital natives. You don't have that 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 uh, uh, hurdle or that difficulties in embedding digitalization with people. The young workforce are digital ready, digital native. I think the the, the companies and the boards and the input uh, 
capitalize on this. Uh, you don't need to do a lot of training courses. Believe me, I mean, if you introduce these digital tools to the younger generation of our workforce, they just pick it and embrace it. And that is an opportunity we never had in the past where, where you have to spend a lot of money and time on teaching people how to use a certain things. Well, they say YouTube is a good YouTube's tool YouTube. to uh, learn a lot of things. <laughs> um, we have some questions from the chat I just want to bring in, and one of them, the first one's talking about, again, from your perspective, how you're seeing education aspects. Um, how do you see the enthusiasm and the urgency response with our in-country universities in Oman to inject energy transition curriculums in their programs? Um, you know, we might have some segments here and there that could be silo, but an energy transition push, essentially, that, that touches on that transformation. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a good question from, from, from Hilal Dabari. I think we, we need, as an industry, we need to do more. We need to really uh, uh, make our voice heard and, and help the universities and, and the academia. Uh, because, you know, uh, in a traditional academia will always be busy by teaching and they don't uh, probably have, have the same focus as we have as an industry. Because for us, it's, 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 uh, it's going to affect our profit, it's going to uh, CO2 taxation may be coming. So, so we, we are on our toes for this. And we need to help the universities, and I think we have, we have done a lot, and we need to do more in terms of embedding this. We reach out, we don't wait for universities to come out, but we have to reach out, and probably uh, what we've seen, when we do that move, we are always welcomed. Uh, it's just maybe the nature of, of the uh, stressed academics uh, in Oman who have to do a lot of teaching, but I think we have seen great collaboration even and, and outside working hours if you, if you walk in, but you need to, I think the industry need to make that move rather than wait for academia to ask for help. Go in, be proactive, uh, offer some of your time and some of your expertise to, to academia. I think it's really, really much appreciated uh, when, when they see you forthcoming because they, that, that support is needed. And this will pay off after some time. You, the same people you are helping, there will be the people who will come and work for you. So if you, if you are there one or two years before they graduate, at least they understand your terminology you have a much easier, easier uh, life uh, get them, onboarding them into the job. So it really pays off uh, reaching out. And I think that actually touched on a, a big point in our last session as well, the idea of localization and energy leading kind of that space to create innovation hubs, as you mentioned, leading that with academia. Uh, we have another question as well, um, kind of touching on the people, planet, profit concept. With countries and blocks uh, are introducing new policies to limit the import of high CO2 footprint products. How is Oman as an oil and gas exporter planning to transition to new energy swiftly and without compromising the GDP and people within the vast industry? I mean, from a PDO perspective, um, how, how is you know, energy renewal addressing that concept or what is your perspective of that people, planet, profit concept, which is all part yeah. of this transition? Yeah, I think, uh... In a, in a way that we are lucky or we, we do have what the resources to tackle the emission. Uh, it is, uh, Oman is blessed by the, the, uh, the natural resources, oil and gas, and that same resources will help us decarbonize. Uh, we have also blessed by the natural resources when it comes to the fuel light, which is, which is a natural rock that can mineralize CO2. We do have the resources to deal with the emissions. Uh, it is uh, maybe uh, for time to come, how do we align our financial uh, inputs and our, our focus into utilizing these resources? And we, we are not stranded when it comes to resources, but uh, we need to make sure that we prioritize and we, we, we move at a speed that is uh, the right speed for, for the world as well. Eh? Because we said we are an energy exporting nation and we have to listen. Uh, if the world, if your customers are no longer buying uh, the same goods, you would have to adapt. And I think that is important. The speed at which we will, will, will utilize our decarbonization resources will depend on how the world is, is, uh, is uh, as a customer, basically, for the energy pushing these resources in one front. In the other front, I think Oman is committed uh, to, to reduce the emission as we have the international uh, agreement or the Paris agreement, and there are plans in place to meet that uh, that commitment uh, that was updated just in July uh, this year. Well, it appears well, that yes. 45 minutes goes by pretty quickly. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Khalil, for answering our questions, of course, and, and sharing your insights uh, throughout this lecture. Um, we appreciate it. Do you want to close out with any closing comments? 
Um, you know, of course, the, the forum today is really tackling water food energy nexus as a whole. We'll be harvesting the recommendations and action points on how to address that. What would be your, let's say, final comment on the, the recommendation that should be adopted coming from an energy renewal perspective? Uh, Ross, I think my final comment would be traditionally uh, the nation or the country of no man relies on oil and gas. And, and uh, it, is, it is not far, but 50 odd years ago that the industry of oil and gas did not, it barely existed. And 50 years is nothing in the, in the age of nations. And I think the next 50 years for those who will be around us and for our children, for our kids will be, will be completely different. And if we are to, uh, to, to, uh, to sail through the, uh, the, uh, the transition times, Collaborate, collaboration will be essential. Cross-sector talks and cross-sector understanding. How does the food sector in Oman, which is a big, I mean, there's a big growth in the food sector in Oman. How do we support that sector and make sure that we benefit each other? Collaboration, I think, is the way to navigate the transition. And, and uh, there is no single entity or single sector that would be allowed, would be able to, to navigate the, the transition uh, in, in, in an effective manner. It would be an expensive navigation. If you do it alone, it will be a cost effective and right uh, navigation through the transition if you do it with everybody. That is my uh, my last message. Seems like one of the most important recommendations to implement. Um, thank you very much for your insights again, Dr. Khalil. For all those who are attending, we will be uploading course this session to our events page and across social media so you can feel free to go there as well to see it and share throughout your networks but thank you very much again um, appreciate your insights have a great rest of your day uh, we'll be following up uh, after the forum too with a special report thank you thank you thank you Brian. thank you everybody thank you.